Right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back again. This is now our fourth webinar. It's Thursday, so we've covered a fair few topics in this webinar series about conducting research that's related to your EMS4 will work in a greater learning placement. Uh, before Dharma starts off his presentation, uh, I just wanted to give you guys a couple of points that I had uh, today. In fact, I visited several companies today and started my round robin visits. I'll come around to yours eventually. And a couple of interesting questions. In fact, I'll maybe highlight one explicitly because uh, someone asked a question, okay, so what if the, the project that I'm thinking about working on within the company doesn't actually last for the 800 hour, uh, six month period? And that's a very good question because your project does not actually need to last for the entire six months. In fact, you might be working on multiple projects. Uh, what, what's important there is the fact that whatever project you work on will have internal deadlines, right? So what you're working on could have a deadline that it needs to be delivered by the end of March. But your actual project for the university needs to be delivered in six months time. You need to make sure that whatever the deadlines are for the company, those are your top notch priorities because you can't put your La Trobe University deadlines ahead of the ones within the company. So what I'm actually getting to here is that your project within the company that you choose as a research topic may only last two months. However, the report that you deliver at the end of the six month period, it's gonna be padded out over that period. So for example, if you're working on something which requires you to in a two week period deliver something for the company, this doesn't mean that you rush your project plan in two weeks and submit it, right? You can pad that out and take your time for the remainder of the time that you have available to you. So please make sure that you can draw the distinction between the actual project that you're working on the company and what needs to be delivered for, for the university. So pad things out. It can even be, for example, a four week project where within that four week project, you're collecting certain data that you want to analyze as part of your research. And what it means is then it runs in parallel to the remainder of your project and so on. So that's one interesting question that came about today. So please keep that in mind that the timelines don't need to be synchronized and the timeline of the university assessments should certainly not come ahead of the assessment, well, not the assessment, the actual delivery of your work within the company. That's critical because if your company doesn't feel that you're delivering because you're delaying things as a result of uh, what it is that you're doing for the university, you're going to have a problem on your hands with that. Okay, Daniel Hook's got a question here as well. And for the pro projects that are longer than six months, could we present what we complete in the time that we're undertaking in Will I progress report? Okay, again, very good question. Yes, but at the same time, you should look at what the deliverables will be at the end of a six month period. So when you do your project plan, if your project within the company is intended to last longer than six months, which is quite common, you should say this project timeline, we believe is going to be 12 months or 18 months as best as you can predict based on the company work. However, the work that I'm going to be executing, the research work is the following. And here is what I'm going to deliver in the next six months as part of my work in a greater learning placement. So again, you need to make the distinction between what's deliverable for the company and what's deliverable for your assessment piece. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of timelines. Thanks for that question, Daniel. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Damid now because I don't wanna take up too much of the time to start with. But you, if you have any questions later on, the questions don't necessarily have to be related just to this particular webinar. The questions can be related to anything that's related to Will uh, as, a, as a broad sort of sense. And don't ask questions which have been answered in the previous webinars. Again, please watch the other webinars. And then if you have questions, ask them. Other than that, if the questions haven't fallen to the scope of any of the webinars, feel free to ask them again. So, Damien, I'm gonna hand the microphone to you now and let you run webinar four. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you, Eddie, and thanks everybody for joining us um, again this week for webinar number four, um, which will focus um, more or less on um, the technical aspects of uh, writing a research project report um, in engineering. So before we introduce today's session and um, sort of run through what we want to cover in the next hour, I just want to, want to very briefly recap what we have already covered so far. So as you might recall in webinar two, 
uh, we started looking at you know the basics of research and how to go on about researching. We looked at keywords, at databases, and then um, we also uh, looked at uh, how a research proposal is written and how it, it is uh, traditionally structured. Um, and then we looked a little bit at the basics of project management um, of, of the writing process. And yesterday in webinar number three, we looked at the very important topic of methodology and methods, and we um, unwrapped that. So we looked at the difference between methodology as the sort of broader philosophical area and methods as the sort of the, the stuff that you get, that you actually do in your project. And we also looked uh, at methods from the engineering perspective specifically and sort of looked at three main ways uh, that methods are applied. What we're going to do today is um, sort of uh, look at the writing process itself. And as you can see in front of you, uh, we're going to cover sort of uh, five main areas. We're going to look at the idea of how to start the process, something that's actually really, really important and very crucial to your project. Uh, we're going to look at the issue of procrastination, which is a real problem, not just for you students, but for anybody who is involved in any writing process. Um, so we just want to unpack it a little bit and give you some tips. And then we're going to look at how to actually start writing. And we're going to look at a particular strategy of how we can go on about writing a 6,000 word piece. We'll then finish off with um, sort of the five C's of technical writing. So there'll be five tips you that you can follow in order to write a successful report. As I mentioned earlier in the week, this uh, webinar will not cover you know, the rudimentary basics of you know, sentence structure and, and, and spelling and tense and etc. Although we will actually touch upon those in the context of the report. But if you require more help with these particular issues, then uh, we would urge you to seek help from um, from the library, um, uh, particularly from the peer learning advisors, which are located in the library, um, and indicating that we would like to get some support in terms of writing a report. We also will provide you with a link to a free um, free webinar that you can uh, access via iTunes, which I had a look at and which actually was kind of quite useful. Um, and it's not very long. It's it's uh, dissected into you know quite small pieces. And it's about the basics of writing in engineering context, in report writing context. And I thought that, uh, you know, it, it looked really, really useful. And I have omitted to put the hyperlink into the draw into this version of the presentation that you've gotten. So I think Eddie or I will just flick that to you um, at the end of the day or tomorrow morning. Okay, so let's sort of dive into um, the content of webinar number three. And we'll start off with the idea of how to actually start writing. Now, um, I've numerously uh, already pointed out to you that this, uh, this piece that you have to do is very different to other pieces of assessment that you would have done in the past because um, it, is a research, it has a research, you know, it's heavily reliant on research, um, it's a research report, but also because it's just very long. So, you know, 6,000 words is not a little piece that's actually fully fledged uh, paper that you know an academic would be writing or a chapter of a book and it takes a long time um, to actually do that um, so the biggest tip of today and this is the thing that I'm going to be probably repeating over and over is that you really need to give yourself sufficient time to plan this and you need to be really well planned and really well uh, project managed um, it is really true that uh, you have two types of um, scenarios that, that, are, that sadly can happen. One is where a student simply leaves it for too late to, to, to generally work on, on the project and tries to complete this in a few days, which usually leads to a disastrous end because you will not have enough time to digest the information, to write up the methodology, to write up your introduction, your literature review, your conclusion, because there's a lot of things that need to go into this. And we're going to look at these details tomorrow in terms of uh, you know your main body and what needs to be in it. The other sad scenario, which is probably even more sad, is when students actually put a lot of effort into into the research and they put a lot of effort into trying to manage the project. However, they simply um, do not pay attention to the fact that they have to write it out and they really struggle with that component. 
So that's when you can get a lot of really great work and really good effort actually all be poured down the drain because the writing lets you down. So it's very, very important that you actually start the writing process very early on. And what we're going to do today is actually give you some tips in terms of how you can do that, so how you can avoid the bad stuff. And the first one, the first big tip, is to really be aware of the fact that procrastination is a very real phenomenon, um, I would say, in all human beings um, when it comes to writing up large pieces of writing. So um, you can put it off to future dates, you know, um, when it's six months to go, when it's five months to go, when it's four months to go. But at some point, there's a tipping point where there's basically a point of no return. Um, you really need to grab a thesis or, or a report which you're writing really by the throat and really get, you know, really, really control it. It cannot control you, basically. So um, as it's seen here, I, I've included this um, PhD comic, something that I really looked at a lot while I was doing my own PhD and, and I really enjoyed these cartoons because um, they're written by someone who's gone through the process um, himself and um, uh, it's excruciatingly true often um, uh, what he writes. And you know, this one is a really fantastic one, which is that, you know, procrastination is that you actually even forget, you know, you set yourself a task for, for day two or day one and um, by the time that you, you know, probably left with a quarter of the time to complete the task, you end up actually drifting off completely to something else, like looking up the word on the internet that describes the thing that you actually, <laughs> the point that you reach, which is the point of no return. So planning and time management are really essential, and we've actually covered the planning and time management part already in the previous webinar when we talked about project management, and we talked about charts and mapping out the time, etc. So really, really important. I know that you've been, uh, you're familiar with projects, and as you already said, I think most of you should be familiar with it, but um, this is still different because this is a project that involved, in, involves you writing 6,000 uh, 6, words. Um, so uh, either you have to be very, very confident with your writing skills, uh, or you have to be a genius in order to pull it off. Otherwise, you will need to write um, from the beginning and go through a lot of processes of editing, writing, revising, editing, writing, revising, editing. Um, so how do you start in the beginning? Um, so here is a sort of um, um, an example of how you can actually approach your writing process. Um, so you can start by writing the title of the project, a brief description of the project. You can think about the objectives and the scope of your project. Uh, because such information may change over the course of the project, which is quite usual in research, and if it does, you should rewrite it. Um, so you just need to start putting something on paper. It's not, you know, in, in day one, um, actually to give you an example, um, even writing my, my own personal experience doing a PhD, which is sort of the most you know, substantial piece of writing that you can do, um, basically writing a book. You know, it can take even up to a year of writing and rewriting and revising to actually even get to understand what you're trying to do in this massive project. So similarly, in a six-month uh, scenario that you're in where you need to submit 6,000 words, it's just important at the beginning that you put something on the paper. And here's an example of how you, how you can start. So thinking simply about, well, what would be the title of the project? Trying to write a very brief, brief description of the project to yourself and also writing the objectives and the scope of the project to yourself. So this is a piece of writing for yourself that tomorrow or more, the day after you can read and then think about whether it actually makes sense or it doesn't. It, this thing, this exercise, exercise does two things for you. One is you get to practice writing and you can sometimes to read your own and sort of be ashamed of what you've written, which happens to all of us and it's you no know, part of the process. And the other one is also that you actually activate in your brain to think analytically and critically, and it's also helping you with the content and with the actual hypothesis that you're working on. So you should try to get into a habit of, you know, every day trying to write, even if it's a little abstract, you know, even if you have a sort of um, one pager, which includes a title, a brief description of the project, your objectives and the scope of your project, and this will be a live document that is going to be changing throughout the time. But you're going to be constantly amending it, you will be constantly adding to it, and in that way you're also practicing your writing throughout. Um, 
In terms of the actual, um, uh, you know, chapter, in terms of the chapter, so the structure of your report, you're going to have an introduction, a literature review, materials and methods, results and discussion, a conclusion and the references. And we're going to run through each one of these parts tomorrow in detail. So we're going to actually look at how you structure an introduction and how you work on a literature review, how you structure material, materials and methods. And remember, we covered materials and methods the sort of from a um, uh, theoretical perspective in depth yesterday. So tomorrow we're actually going to go into the nitty gritty of how you actually structure it. And we're going to give you an example of each one of these co uh, components. Um, but today it's not about writing these particular components. Today it's more about the basic skills that you need and the basic tricks uh, that you can have up your sleeves in order to be successful in the writing part of this. Because of course each one of these consists of you know the linguist your linguistic ability to write well, but also uh, you need to cover certain things. So you need to be able to have to be talking about something substantive and something that. Um, 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 that actually makes sense. So today it's not about that part, today it's about the actual writing skill, the craft of writing um, generally, and then tomorrow we're going to look at each one of these in, more, in specific detail and provide you with examples for each. Um, so uh, let's now head to our next uh, slide, which is um, the, this sort of reiterating this idea that I've already told to you, which is that you need to start writing early. So one way to do it is to, to kind of keep this one page that I've already told you, uh, that I've that explained to you, which you know is divided into these four sections. The other one is actually try to really smash out a very early quick draft at the beginning. Um, uh, the biggest problem that mostly all of you will have is to write the introduction. And the biggest problem that students have often is that they actually try to write that introduction first and they get lost in the introduction. And it really makes sense that this is a problem because think about it. An introduction sets the scene. It actually outlines already what your hypothesis will be. It already tells the reader uh, more or less about the conclusion. So it, it tells about the journey that you as a writer will take the reader on. So it actually starts with a point A entry and it finishes with Z, which is it needs to explain in a very brief way everything. So you can now understand why it is very difficult and stupid in a way to start writing the introduction first. Because the only way you could write that first is if you were an absolute genius and knew exactly what you want to write. And of course, none of us are. Um, so what we're going to... Um, suggest in this webinar series is, is the sort of the basic structure of how to flip this. So it makes sense to start with an introduction because you think logically speaking, well, I've got to start at the beginning, which is the introduction, and then when I finish at the end, which is the conclusion. But this, as I'm suggesting, is actually not a very clever way to do it. Um, so the reason for that is the following. So the task can be made less daunting and more efficient by adopting a simple writing strategy for the first draft. And this strategy involves dividing the report into three main parts. So think about it the following way. Your report consists of your work, it actually consists of other people's work, and it consists of a summation. So what do we mean by that? So the chapters in the report that are your work are the methods and materials, so the methodology that we discussed yesterday, and the results in discussion. Now, these are the things that require you to tell the reader, you take control, you're in the driving seat. You're gonna tell the reader about your methodology. You're gonna tell the reader about your methods and the materials. And in the results and in the discussion, it is your responsibility as the writer of the research report to give meaning to the data that you have presented in the methods and the materials. So you need to then be the scientific voice that actually takes the authoritative uh, um, uh, pathway. You're sitting in the driver's seat and you're telling us what the meaning of the, of the data is. So that is your work. The chapters in the thesis that is other people's work is the literature review. Because remember, the literature review is the point where you need to prove to the reader 
that you are aware about all of these other people who have been writing about the topic that you are interested in. So it's just a point, it's a section of your report where you bring these pieces of other people's work together and you try to find a logical way to present um, uh, that literature to your readers. So that's not your work, that's actually someone else's work. Uh, and the chapters in the thesis that are the summation are the abstract, which uh, you may or may not be writing, as well as the introduction and the conclusion. So they're those parts that summing up your entire work. Okay, so if we keep this in mind, we try to divide the work into uh, your work, other people's work, and summation, then how should we then uh, create a strategy to move forward? Well, what we're suggesting is that an effective strategy in writing is to actually start with the familiar and then move to the less familiar. And the part of the thesis, or the report, sorry, that is most familiar to you, of course, is your own research on which you have spent the most time. Therefore, you should start your first draft by writing about your work. And that is the methods and materials, and the results and the discussion. And if you do that, you actually will be much more likely to succeed. Um, and you should be really, technically speaking, be able to write this up in a relatively short period of time. And remember, because you will not be writing, um, uh, you know, you will not be writing one draft. That's why I keep reiterating that this is not something that you can do overnight. It can, this is not something that can be done in the last month. Writing is a process. It requires you to write, to rewrite, to analyze, to get others to give you opinions on it, and then to go back to the drawing board and write again. So therefore, it's not about writing the perfect methods and materials or the results in the discussions, but you're gonna write this many, many times. And every time that you write it, not only will you be improving the language, so you will be improving the way you express yourself, you will also actually be sharpening your sections. You will be more logical. You will find flaws in the logic, you will find flaws in the data, and you will be improving this as you go. And remember the methods and materials and the results and discussions are the heartbeat of your thesis. This is what you're going to get judged on. So that's why it's so important to put as much effort as you can into these particular pieces of writing. So once your own work has been written up, it's then that you can move to write the literature review chapter. And the literature review chapter, as we've said, is not your work, that's actually someone else's work. And if you write that part after you've written the methods and materials, as well as the results and discussions, you will actually help to ensure that you include only literature that is directly relevant to your work. So this is the process of eliminating. If you write the literature review, which by the way, I'm not saying you're not gonna be writing from the beginning because you're gonna have a section of the draft that is gonna constantly be updating the literature review. Everything that you read will go onto that list and it will be uh, um, annotated. So there'll be little keywords attached to each one that you know, help you to make sense of what that particular reading, why it was relevant to you, right? So every time that you actually go back to your literature review, and I'm talking about start to write it, to actually start to write the proper end result. Because you've spent so much time in your methods and materials and results and discussions, you will now start to eliminate certain literature because now you will realize that it actually is not relevant at all to your work. And no literature should be in your literature review that is not relevant to your work. That's something that you can get marked. Not only that, you will also be able to appraise the literature critically from the perspective of the own work. So what that means is that you're going to look at that literature through a different lens because you will look at that piece of literature through the way that you've written your methods, materials, and the way that you've made sense of your data in your results and discussions. So you're going to be able to actually uh, structure it and form it in a way that is really, really sharp. And it is showing the reader that you're fully in control of the uh, of your research report, and indeed fully in control of the project that you're running, because you're not only including just the relevant literature to your review, uh, literature relevant to your, um, to your work, but you're also including it in a way that is logical, that is to the point, and it simply makes sense. 
So after, and only after you've drafted the chapters of your work and others' work, should you actually start writing the summation chapters, which are your introduction and your conclusion. So it's only that. It's actually the last step. And there, you should actually start with the introduction and finish with the conclusion. And remember that the introduction comprises the background, your objectives, and your scope. And remember, I told you, you should be working on that anyway on the side throughout your writing process. So this is why um, this is a really great trick. If you have that thing, that one pager that you're constantly updating as you're doing anything, then you actually are sort of in parallel as you're writing your methods, materials, and discussions, also updating, well, what is actually my objective and my scope of the project? So this way you're actually in control of your project from the beginning to the end. Uh, and the conclusion, of course, sums up the findings and states that the objectives are, objectives are fulfilled. Um, so therefore it should obviously immediately follow the introduction or indeed I would say that it is a concurrent process. Um, so I really hope that, that, that this slide, which I think is arguably the most important slide in, uh, in this in tonight's webinar uh, makes sense to you and if it doesn't I really would like to hear from you um, um, you know at the end of um, at the end or during the discussion period that we're going to have after I finish talking but this is a very very important slide and if you follow this advice if you actually try to implement this strategy I can promise you that you will be in control of your project but more importantly you will feel that you're in control and when you feel that you're in control of your writing, it will actually allow you to be very creative and to focus on the things that really matter, which is your methods, materials, the content of what you do, the real thing in the middle, the, the, the thing that the words are describing, the meaning that is in the words. Um, so I hope that, that you will find this useful. Okay, so here is a sort of visual representation for those of you who prefer a sort of uh, to see, you know, um, to see rather than to hear. Here again, you can see how your work is comprised of the methods and materials, results and discussions, and how you should be writing these two first and then revising them, of course, because once you've written methods and materials and you write your results and discussions, you will find that you might have to actually adjust your methods and materials because the results and discussions, they're just not making the point stick or the point doesn't stick, you can't land the, the punch. So therefore you need to go back. Once you've done that a few times and you feel like, no, you know what, I'm actually in control of what I'm doing here. It's logical, it makes sense. The data is valid. Then you can start working on other people's work, which is the literature review. You then look at the literature review through that particular lens, through your lens, through your methods and materials and your results and discussions which means that you turn the other people's works into your work. How does the literature help you to make sense of this? How does the literature, or how did it help you to actually set this up in the first place? Why did you decide on particular methods? Often you will be referring to the literature review to justify that. There might have been a gap. No one has ever thought about solving my problem or the problem that I, have, that I have identified in this particular way. Or many good people have done it in this way, which is why I'm also trying to do it, etc., etc. And once you have done that, you can move into the summation, which is writing the introduction and the conclusion, revising the introduction, because you need to have complete consistency between the two. They're saying the same thing, basically. They have to be saying the same thing. Once you're sure that there are, you can actually move to your abstract, which is arguably the most difficult thing to do because that has everything in it. It's your introduction and your conclusion in one paragraph. So I hope that this sort of, here's another, you know, a visual representation of, of the thing that I've just been talking for, you know, nearly 30 minutes. Um, so please look at that and please ask questions if, 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 if it doesn't make sense to you. Okay, so what we're going to do now is move into the five C's of technical writing. So what are those? Well, they are the following. 
you need to actually, in a technical report, write in a way that is clear. Your writing needs to be concrete. Your writing needs to be concise. It needs to be correct. And it needs to be consistent. And the reason for these five C's is that engineering, generally speaking, demands objectivity, accuracy, and precision from you. And of course, these qualities are also equally expected when you're actually writing in the field. So we can't say that, you know, in engineering, we really need to be objective, accurate, and precise, but then we try to write, and then, you know, it's a dog's breakfast. It just doesn't work that way. And this is not something that specifically relates to research assignments or research reports. This is something that you're going to have to get used to because you're going to have to write in the jobs. So you need to be able to show that you can be objective, accurate, and precise, not only through everyday, everyday behavior at your work, the way that you manage your projects, the way that you engage, etc. You actually have to prove that also through your, written, through your writing skills. So you need to try to observe the five C's of technical writing. Um, in sum, the way that all of this can be summed up um, is to say that whatever you do, whenever you write, you really need to be straightforward and you should be really easily read and understood. It's not different to talking. If you talk, so if I finish this uh, tonight's webinar and you come out thinking, well, I feel more confused than I actually was before um, I was listening to this guy for one hour, then I failed to be straightforward and I failed to actually uh, be understood. Um, so when you write, it's the same thing. Do not overcomplicate things. And we're going to go through these things now in a moment through some technical tips of how not to do it. Just try to, you know, and you use this metaphor yesterday as well, um, you know, keep the ball on the ground, as we would say in soccer. Do not try fancy things, just pass to the next player that wears the same shirt as you, open up and you know, open up the space and be available to receive the ball again. Similar thing in writing. Don't use words that you don't even know what they mean. Don't use difficult structure to describe things because you think it sounds really fancy. It doesn't, it's just really hard to read and people don't like it. Keep things very, very simple. So what we're going to do now is we're going to run through each one of these and we're going to look at examples of how to be clear, how to be concrete, how to be concise, how to be correct and how to be consistent when you're writing uh, research reports in engineering contexts. So be clear. First point, avoid using ambiguous language. So when does ambiguity occur? It occurs when a word or a phrase or a sentence has more than one meaning and the reader cannot actually determine what you're intending to say. And these ambiguities arise from four specific sources and we're gonna actually run through each one of those. First one is your word choice. The second one is your sentence structure. Third is your pronouns. And fourth is your punctuation. So let's have a look at an example, and the example that's on this slide is one that refers to word choice. Um, one of the amazing things about English is that, you know, we have um, words that have multiple meanings. Um, and an example that I've provided you here, which I'll run in, through in a moment, is uh, the word affected. And I'll tell you this as someone who's speaking English. So English is my third language. So I speak Bosnian, that's my native tongue. I speak German and I learned English through German. And I find it really shocking um, how imprecise English as a language is. Because the language that I'm used to, actually in German more than in Bosnian, but Bosnian equally so, we have words that mean particular things. So there's a lot of words that describe specific things. English has a lot of words that can mean different things in different contexts, and you need to be aware of that. So here's an example, the sentence, the flow of water was affected. Affected can mean that the flow of water was slowed down, sped up, or it was stopped. So you should be replacing it with one of those more precise expressions in order to eliminate the ambiguity. So really be aware of that. And for you, that's even more important than 
other disciplines because it makes a massive difference whether it was slowed down, sped up or stopped. And the people reading your reports will pick up on that automatically. So avoid using ambiguous language. Think about the words that you're using and what they mean. Another way that ambiguity arises is in the actual sentence structure. And I would say that that's actually more common in the assignments that I'm reading often from students. So when you're actually not careful about how you order words and, and phrases and sentences, you can be very, very ambiguous. And an example is given um, um, here on the slide. So think about the following sentence. The memory module was lowered to the horizontal position the required testing. So why is this uh, uh, sentence structure ambiguous? It is ambiguous because of the improper placement of the phrase that required testing. When you actually play, uh, uh, place that phrase in a different position in the sentence as such, so for example, the memory module that required testing was lowered to the horizontal position, you actually are avoiding the ambiguity. But you can see that it's a very slight difference between the two sentences, but they actually mean completely different things, or they can mean completely different things. And remember that one of the important things is that you need to be precise. So you also, if you have data sets and you're referring to data sets, you also need to use language that's actually referring to data in a very precise way. You can't, you, you can't allow language to open up multiple meanings for people where the reader is then asked to, test, to, to guess what you're actually trying to say. Because the onus is on you to control the language and your report. No one should be guessing. The other one, equally important, is ambiguity in punctuation. How you use full stops, commas, columns, semicolons. Um, and the example here that is given is uh, the sentence need methanol, need ethanol, methanol and 10% water and ethanol and 10% water were examined in this study. And I can tell you, you might look at it and laugh, but I read, and Eddie I'm sure has read many, many similar sentences where different things are packed up into a sentence using commas. So it's really unclear from that sentence how many fuels were actually examined. So if you want to eliminate the ambiguity from that sentence, a use of colon and comma before the final item in the series would fix it. So here's the example. In this study, comma, the following four fuels were examined. Colon, need methanol, etc., 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 and you have fixed it. Um, a general rule around punctuation, particularly around the use of commas, is to read your sentences aloud. This is a very simple but a fantastic trick. When you're proofreading, read it aloud, and every time you're using um, uh, punctuation, react appropriately. So if there is a full stop, stop. If there is a comma, stop for a second, pause, then continue reading. If there's a column, stop and then wait to see whether things are being listed. This way you will be able, it's a very, very simple uh, trick to use, but it's very effective. And it requires you to take a paragraph and to actually read it aloud to yourself. And if you have someone who's listening, to actually read it aloud while somebody else is listening and telling you, uh, I'm not sure why you're stopping there, you know, like it's weird. And then you say, oh no, no, I am stopping because I have a purpose. And then someone will respond to you, etc. And the last one uh, that, um, that I'd like to uh, make you aware of is the ambiguity in the pronouns, particularly it and this. Um, so this is a real, this is a tricky one. Again, often it's, it actually con uh, creates a lot of confusion. Um, and there's two examples. One is here on the use of it, and the other one is on the use of the pronoun this. So let's look at it first. Sentence, is over here and it starts as the receiver presented the radiometer with a high flux environment it was mounted in a silver plate stainless steel container so what's the problem well given the number of possible references so you've got receiver radiometer and the environment for it so this is the three things that it could mean the sentence is much clearer if the writer repeats the noun radiometer and look what happens when you actually do that as the receiver prevented the radiometer with a high flux environment, the radiometer was mounted. Na, 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 na. 
it's very clear what you're referring to. Um, in terms of this, um, uh, the trick uh, that, that is, uh, so one of the tricks that is given to you here is uh, to actually name whatever that this refers to immediately after you use this. So, tectonic burial by thirsting is believed to occur rapidly. This assumption, however, is difficult to test. So, you just make it very clear what the this is actually, um, um, what it actually is referring to. So these are again, very simple sort of things that you can do, but they actually make a really big difference in your writing. And again, it's about being very simple. You know, why not repeat it after you've used the pronoun? It doesn't cost you anything and it makes it very, very um, easy to read. Um, and, I, and, and, and I don't know why sometimes the psychology of writing, when, when we write, we sometimes fail to do this. Maybe people think, well, I'm repeating something that's obvious. In this case, it actually isn't. When you're using pronouns, it's much better to make sure that you really understand what you're referring to. Okay, so here is some sort of examples also um, around how you can prefer plain words over difficult words. Uh, and you'll see on the right hand side some of the complex words i wouldn't even know how to pronounce some of them but um you know you have much simpler ways to express yourself um, you know why not say self-evident uh, rather than axiomatic apprise inform or tell um, endeavor try attempt um, uh, purvey sell supply etc etc and this particularly tends to be maybe uh, an issue in technical writing reports because you might try to kind of, you know, really show the reader that you are on top of things and you're a very sophisticated thinker. Well, using complex word is not a way to do that. You do that through your data and through your methodology, the way that you rip apart a literature review, the way that your argument is mounted, the way that you write your hypothesis. This is how you do it. You do not do it by, you know, trying to put fancy words into your sentence structure because often you actually have the opposite effect. People look and say, oh, you know, I'm just trying to think of metaphors. It's like, um, yeah, you know, don't, don't try to be flashy. Just try to actually, it's not what's on the outside. It's not the way your car looks on the outside. It's actually how, it, how well it can run. So, you know, it's, um, that's how you, people are gonna read your report. And I'm gonna look and say, oh, wow, what a beautiful, um, you know, paint job you've got in your car, and, and you, you know, they're going to say, "Well, I'm going to sit." They're going to be sitting in your car and driving, and then going, "Well, this is a horrible experience." So avoid those complex words. And here's some examples of how you can change them. And there's plenty of you know uh, sort of online tools that you can type in. You can use if you're using word document, you can look for synonyms, etc., to make things easier. Okay, so the don'ts of technical writing. So here are some habits that you can avoid in order to ensure that you're actually clear and correct. So we're still talking in clarity here. Please don't use jargons unnecessarily. Um, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, with the sort of social media world that we live in now, they kind of are creeping in every way. So this is not Twitter. This is not Facebook. You're, not, you're writing a technical report. Avoid the jargons. Um, particularly if the reader is not going to understand them. Don't combine words to make up new words. That refers to the older slide. Believe it or not, that happens quite a lot. You know, you, people want to show how really clever they are, so they combine words in a way that is not natural or it's actually, you know, grammatically incorrect. Um, also, don't use words that are not in the dictionary. Uh, so again, refers to very, um, you know, difficult sort of words that actually don't, don't officially exist. Don't start sentences with a number. So that's a simple thing, but you know, write out 10, don't write the number 10. Don't also start a sentence with an abbreviation. Uh, so you write out in full if it is the first word of the sentence. So for example, figure 10 shows, you don't go note, fig, you know, 10, etc. Don't write it actually out, write the full sentence out, and we're going to talk about full sentence writing in the moment as well. Um, also, don't use absolutes, extremes like always and never. You don't need them. The only thing that they do is actually they can harm you more than anything else because only use them if it's really the point that you're trying to land. So if your hypothesis relies on an always and a never, then do it.
But if it doesn't, don't use it. Because what a reader can do is say, uh, I'm not quite sure about it always. You know, I think I can think off the top of my head about exemptions. And then that hurts your credibility. So if you're using absolutes, make sure that they actually need it. That they're part of the intellectual core of your, uh, of your uh, report. Uh, and also don't assume universal format. Um, so, you know, obviously, even in, within engineering, there are disciplines and sub-disciplines that have their own uh, format and conventions. And we're going to, uh, and indeed, you're going to be provided with a, with a format and convention uh, tomorrow. But also, there is a format and, uh, and convention that, that uh, Eddie is uploading in terms of how you need to write your report. And for example, also in uh, webinar two, I provided you with links to IEEE's um, referencing style, which also is a particular um, discipline in its own right or sub discipline within. Um, so be aware of that. Okay, so be concrete, and what we mean here is that you need to be precise. So you need to choose the right words. And the example that is provided here is simply the difference between the, you know, between the word weight and mass, which I don't have to explain to you because you're all engineers, so you will be aware of it. But it's sometimes easy to forget. This is a sort of banal example, a very you know, straightforward example. There'll be other things that are a little bit more tricky. Um, um, similarly, uh, you see there that uh, words can have specific meaning. So comprise and compose, and again, you'll be very much on top of this, but the sentence water comprises hydrogen and oxygen is actually imprecise because comprise actually means to include. And what you should be writing is that it's water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen. So again, it seems for a lay person, so let's say me as a historian reading this, I would go, well, yeah, sure, it does comprise of uh, hydrogen and oxygen, but it's actually incorrect because that word has a specific meaning. The examples I would give you would be things like me in the in, in humanities using a term that's very loaded. So for example, I once wrote in a paper how I found an experience to be uncanny. And all I wanted to say is that I felt really strange, something felt really strange. But then of course, a reviewer pointed out that the word uncanny has got literature of millions and millions of words, uh, which started off with Sigmund Freud and writing about the word uncanny. So it has a particular meaning. I wasn't even thinking about that. I just wanted to use, to use the word uncanny. But then um, for me to use it, I actually need to explain the particular meaning that I'm attaching to it. So please be aware of, of, of when you choose your words. And this is also a really good tip generally in, in when you're in your placement, etc. cetera. Um, and, um, Avoiding imprecise or inexact statements, you can see there is uh, some examples of often imprecise statements, so we don't have to go through all of them. Um, let's you know, use the first one, the readings were reasonably accurate. Well, use numbers if possible. So you can't just say that they were reasonably accurate. 60% of the readings were accurate would be more precise way to put it. If a gear failed because of an excessive number of uh, load cycles, you need to provide the exact figure to actually make it, to make, to make this count. Um, and also think about the sort of exaggerated statements which can, you know, which can inflate your claim. Like there are millions of data points to be examined. You know, don't say it because if you know, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's so, so vague and out of the blue kind of, that it really it diminishes potentially some really good research that you have done. All right, uh, in terms of being concise, there is two other tips. One is to um, eliminate redundancies. So an example that you can see here is, you know, if you're referring to aluminium, you don't have to say that the aluminium metal, etc., etc. It's obvious. You can, you can, uh, um, the word metal was made redundant the moment you use the word aluminium. But again, this, this does happen to, uh, this does tend to happen often with students particularly. So um, this is a really great example of how you can get rid of words and phrases which actually serve no purpose at all. Um, and actually the only thing that they do is make your writing really long-winded, long, long -winded, you know, it just goes on and on and on. That's how it feels at least. Um, and also you should think about it here that people reading these reports have to read thousands and thousands of words. So this is how you can get an examiner off 
you know, kind of off guard. You start writing and you go, oh my God, you know, I, this is the fifth report and I'm reading. And, you know, this, this, this already feels like going to be a long journey. And it's going to be no different in professional life. People don't have the time. If they feel it's a waste of time, people are probably going to stop reading. So, so, so avoid redundancies and also eliminate meaning, meaningless phrases. Um, and, you know, people tend to use these quite, quite often. So, you know, things like it is interesting to know, uh, you don't need it. You know, why, why is it interesting? And then there is some examples for you on the bottom of meaningless phrases, as well as examples of redundancies. And, you know, have a look at those and then think about your own writing. And then if you, if you can see that you're guilty in, in terms of some of these, that's really easy to eliminate. All right, so we're going to move on now to the last bit of being concise, which is uh, replacing wordy phrases with shorter alternatives. And this is probably one of the biggest tips that I've ever received when I started writing, particularly in English. And this is the magic of language. At this point in time, now, during the course of, during, has the ability or the potential to, can. It's very, very powerful. I mean, if you read those, it's, it's sort of amazing. You know, in spite of the fact that, though, in view of the fact that, because. So these are, I think this is a, you know, a really great table that, again, what I would be doing if I were you is just going through these slides and going, oh, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. It's like someone recording you when you're speaking and you do a lot of hmm or you repeat certain things all the time and someone taps you on the shoulder and says, you know, you say that a lot. And then you listen to your recording and go, holy moly, yes, I really do. I probably should stop that. It's a kind of similar equivalent to that. Um, so I think this, these, these three slides are really, really powerful and they can really help you to make your writing really good. And we're telling you now you should be confident to write in this way because it will make you stronger. It kind of feels really counterintuitive, but I can't repeat enough. Let the data and the structure of your, of your report and your tone uh, um, be the thing that is uh, standing out. Let that show how good you are, not things like how many words you're writing and how flashy it might look. Um, this is really not relevant. That should be actually not in the way. Don't let the language be in the way of the gold mine that you've got in your research. Okay, uh, be correct. So you need to use formal language and you actually use, you need to use correct uh, grammar. Now, um, I'll go through formal language and then we'll talk about grammar in a little bit. Um, uh, and then there'll be another slide that, that, that will sort of give a couple of examples. In terms of the formal language, this is similar, at this point already has been raised. You can't use, uh, you know, slang. So again, dicey, awesome, iffy, hassle. It doesn't belong. Colonial, uh, colloquial language doesn't belong in the report. Um, you, you, you need to write in an official formal language. Um, it's really, really important. It's like writing an email. You know, it's quite shock, shocking. You know, as a lecturer, you receive an email and it doesn't start off with at least hi, Daniel. For me, it already feels like, well, I'm not your WhatsApp friend or I actually don't even know who you are. And, you know, so there are some certain rules of engagement um, and writing a report is an official sort of exercise so the language needs to be formal. It's like you're being invited to, you know, to a, uh, to a nice uh, dinner party and then, uh, you know, you rock up in thongs, a t-shirt and you haven't had a shower. You know, it's not appropriate. When you're writing a report, there are certain rules that you need to follow um, and writing formally your language needs to be formal is a very important part of that. It also shows respect. Um, and not to speak about the fact that, you know, you're already guys in professional settings that, you know, it can be, uh, I guess, a de potential death to a career because it might indicate that you're not being serious, even though you don't intend it. But, you know, and that's, that's a sort of symbolism, the, the symbolic kind of meaning that's coming out of it. Um, being grammatically correct means actually most importantly to use the correct tense. And we don't have the time to go through the tenses, but usually you will use, when you write a report, past tense. Um, whatever you do, try to be consistent. That's the most important thing. So if you're writing using a particular tense, you need to be consistent in that tense. 
And if you need help with a tense, then you need to go and get some help in the library or read up a little bit about it or listen to that webinar that we're going to uh, share with you. Uh, because, you know, I don't, it's just like a whole other world that opens up um, and we will not have time to, to, um, to go into, it, into that much detail. Um, what I do want to point out is the idea of writing well, well formed sentences. So this is like, this is the basic of the basic of the basic. Um, which is the, you know, to conform to the grammatical rules of the English language. And there are basically three criteria for well-formed and grammatical sentences. The first one is that your sentence has to have a subject. There needs to be a subject. So here's an example. Electrospinning can be used with different syn synthetic as well as natural origin poly polymers. Um, the subject is electrospinning. So that's a subject of your sentence. You also need to have a complete verb, the action word in your sentence. And as C's, verb cultured, that is your complete verb in a petri dish. And lastly, but very importantly, the sentence that you're writing needs to convey a complete thought. And you can be the judge of that. You can be the judge. Read a sentence that you've written, and then think about it. Does it have a subject? Does it have an action word? And is it actually completing a thought? Very simple. It may sound, you know, this may sound like ridiculous that we're mentioning this, but it is kind of, if you can stick to this, you're going to write quite well. Everything else will come. Um, so compare here, there's a comparison of two sentences. A, although the corridor for ships traveling to and past Singapore is well defined, and then B, Although the corridor for ships traveling to and past Singapore is well defined, comma, this corridor is not closely monitored. So you can see that sentence number one, the thought just stops halfway through. There is there's something missing in it. Although the corridor for ships traveling to and past Singapore is well defined, full stop, it's not a full thought. The full thought is underneath in, in sentence two. So, and sentence A is grammatically incorrect, sentence B is grammatically correct, but most importantly, it's actually conveying meaning. And it has these three elements that are being satisfied. So this is probably the biggest basic tip that you can get, um, is to think through this way. And this will also allow you to be very simple in your writing because sen your sentences will suddenly become quite, quite short. The other thing is to be consistent. Um, so you need to be consistent with using your keywords in your spelling and format for units. And you should be able to do that because I've sent you that IEEE referencing guide, which will help you with formats of unit, uh, with format for units. Spelling, you will be consistent because most likely you'll be working in a Word document, which means that you can set it to a particular spelling, which in this case would be Australian English. And the computer, more or less, the, the software will help you to be consistent in your spelling because you'll pick up things like using Z instead of S, um, et cetera, et cetera. And when you use your keywords, you need to stick to those. So, you know, and your, 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 um, and there's some examples even here, you know, that I've got, that I've got on the screen and I'm going to go into too much detail here. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Think about keywords, think about your spelling, and think about your format. Um, um, and be, stick to those, be consistent. It's better to pick the wrong format and be consistent than to be inconsistent, I would say. Even though picking the wrong, wrong format, if you've been provided with one, is also fairly silly. And I think we are on the dot, um, 7.59, which leaves me with one minute to kind of sum up what we have actually covered and to maybe say what is the most important thing. Um, I think that, uh, I hope you got the main point out of this, which is that, um, you know, we did not cover sort of the nitty gritty. We actually stuck to sort of some of the basics of, of how to write well. And um, we've given you the five C's, which have covered that. So you can go through this in your own time. But we also really reiterated the, the important point, which is, um, that you need to start writing early. But more importantly, we gave you a really, really good strategy to do that. So um, if you have never written a report before, if you stick to the strategy that we've provided you with, which is to divide your work into the three components, which is your own work, 
other people's work and summation and follow that schema that we've given you in terms of how you tackle, writing, uh, tackle your writing. And if throughout the process you have your one pager, which essentially is performing the task of being your introduction and your summation, where you're just sort of focusing on these three key things, which is the scope of your project, and, uh, you know, your timeline, etc., what we've covered, then, then I think that you, you will be on the, on the right pathway. So thanks, everybody. And if you have any questions, you have now half an hour to ask. If your question is not related to this particular topic, that's completely fine. You can ask any question related to any, anything to do uh, with your will experience.